It is 4.30. This is a community outreach subcommittee meeting with the participation of the full school committee. committee. And I will call the subcommittee meeting to order at 4.30 p.m. So, Chair Carrie Mee, would you like to call the full school committee to order? Thank you, Libby, and welcome, everyone. Um, Yes, uh, uh, I want to first thank uh, Steve Becker and the Hingham IT department. We have increased our Zoom license so that we can have up to a thousand people at all of these forums and our upcoming me meetings because people are understandably interested in all this. Um, very quickly, I wanted to call roll just for the minutes and also so the school committee members can uh, identify themselves. So Michelle Ayer. Here. <laughs> Jen Benham. Here. Ness Carenti. Here. Carlos identified himself earlier. Uh, Libby is here. Uh, Liza O'Reilly? Here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Hello, and thank you all for coming. I do have to read this comment. Uh, this meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to an order issued by the governor of Massachusetts dated March 12, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the Town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with Massachusetts General Law C30A20F so that the chair may inform all other participants of said recording. Is anybody recording this meeting? Okay, great. The three hour long forums being held today are for all of us to hear more from Superintendent Dr. Austin about the school reopening draft plan. These forums are also for the school committee to hear comments and questions from the community as we prepare for our meeting tomorrow night, during which we hope to vote on a plan. The forums are being recorded by Harbor Media and will be made available for public viewing. The slides that Dr. Austin is presenting were emailed to all families and posted on the Hingham Public Schools webpage today. We will also be sharing a frequently asked questions document once the learning model is approved by the school committee. Dr. Austin will start tonight with an overview of the updated draft plan that will answer a lot of questions. We received hundreds of questions over the past few days and grouped them by theme. He will address most of the themes and provide a lot of answers. But we do request your patience as we do not have all of the answers at this time. If after Dr. Austin finishes presentation, you wish to ask a question, please raise your hand with the raise hand button and I will call on you as time permits. Please state your name and address. This is a one question limit and a two minute limit per person. I will be timing. Please have your video on while speaking as this is helpful to those with assistive hearing technology. And please remember to mute, your, mute yourself after speaking. If we do not have time to get to your questions, or even if we do, please join us for the 7 p.m. forum tonight Come to the school committee meeting tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Come to the school committee meeting on August 10th at 7 p.m. And come to the coffee with the superintendent on August 13th at 9 a.m. And of course, you can always email us. Dr. Austin, I pass the mic to you. Please take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Libby, and thank you, everyone. I think that uh, given that list of all the things that are coming up, uh, you're going to be really sick of seeing me. So uh, I, I give you the endurance test, I guess, for that. Uh, I have a, a, a written statement that I want to share with all of you. And, and I know some of you were here in the morning with us. And so if I, it's going to sound very, very familiar to that. Uh, I do apologize for repeating that, but I think it re bears repeating uh, again this afternoon. So good afternoon, everyone. I wanna open this afternoon by thanking all of you for attending the meeting today. Robust and healthy debate is needed in times like this, and we should welcome differing opinions. For if we listen carefully to each other, it will be these differing opinions that will encourage us to think differently and to hopefully bring us to the best possible solutions. Over the course of the past few days, I have seen the best and worst of people from Hingham. 
since Friday evening, I have received hundreds of emails ranging from thoughtful ideas and opinion to unfounded accusation and unfortunately name calling. I read each one, even the ones that flooded my inbox minute after minute, hour after hour, with only the names changed in the text. However, a common thread I heard in all was the request for me and Hingham Public Schools to quote unquote, do better. I take that to heart and I can assure you that I will always strive to do better. But I ask the same from all of you. This is no time to blame teachers, administrators, government officials or parents for this terrible predicament. We have exceptional staff, teachers, administrators and parents in Hingham who are fiercely dedicated to our students. And I stand by each one of my staff members as we navigate these difficult waters. Many districts, and there will be many more, have already concluded that there is just no way to reopen schools to students this fall. But I believe if there is any district that can bring our students back to school in the fall, it will be Hingham Public Schools. But to do so, we must come together with grace and patience. We have to work together. This past weekend, we were just a few hours shy of canceling graduation due to parties that happened around the town. I ask you to partner with me to ensure that we follow the CDC and the state guidelines to ensure that we stay safe and that we can get the chance to please reopen our schools. This is a serious time. We watch in the Commonwealth as the numbers of coronavirus, and I know that people will tell me tonight that they're low and all these things that we have right now, they are rising. They are doubling from the last two to three weeks, they've doubled. We need to get this under control right now so that we have the opportunity to come back to school. On Thursday night, I will provide the school committee with the three options for opening schools in the fall. These options are fully remote, fully open, or a hybrid model, which is a combination of open and remote. Since May, more than 100 people have met for countless hours, engaging in thoughtful conversation and poring over the massive guidance as it arrived. I don't believe that there are any ideas that have been brought by the community that, had, that these groups have not considered carefully and debated thoughtfully. The majority of these people did this work unpaid and on their own, own time. Many of them were teachers. I wanna personally thank them for their effort and time, but unfortunately, their work is not done. I think we all know and accept that it's all hands on deck at this time until the opening of schools. On Thursday night, I will recommend the plan that these hardworking individual, individuals recommended to me this past week, which is a hybrid phased in reopening. But I caution all of you to understand that this is not likely the final plan. We must be flexible as we continue to determine how best to move forward. As new guidance arrives, we will have to adjust. You have my word that when that happens, I will communicate with all of you to keep you informed. Today, I'm gonna to give you another preview of the extensive work that's been done, but it's my hope, and I know we're closer to that, that by the end of today, our full draft of the report will be released. This is the report that is due to DESE on the 10th of August. Many people are on this call, many of our staff, but they are multitasking right now by also editing our final draft version as I speak. Please expect the approximate 70 pages of more detailed work and consideration in the final draft. It is extensive and it's an amazing amount of work. We're still evolving, evolving, and we will continue to evolve right up until September 16th. I'm gonna make one other comment during all the emails, I've heard how other towns have already put out their drafts and their plans are all solid. I have to caution all of you, nothing is solid at this time. These are all drafts that towns are putting out. Many have not gone into negotiations with their unions or if they have, they're in that process. I am in negotiations with our union and we are working through a collaborative process to make all of this come forth and, and be successful. I wanna be clear about that. And I'm asking our teachers, I know that what we're asking you is to have courage and walk into the classroom at a time of great fear that you have. I didn't say this this morning, 
but many of our staff members, several of our staff members, I don't wanna say many, lost family members during the COVID-19. The thought of walking into a classroom, regardless of where we are, but we still are under the coronavirus scare, is very, very difficult for them. I want us to all be mindful that when we ask people to do this, it is a difficult undertaking. I wanna tell the staff that I'm not gonna ask you to do something I would not be willing to do. I will be beside you when we open our schools. I will be there to support you and I will be there every single day. So thank you. Julie, if you would hook up the, uh, the slideshow, please. The slideshow was actually put together to answer many of the questions I received in advance. So the agenda, we're gonna, we're gonna go through the facilities subcommittee, the work that the committee did, which includes the feasibility study, talk about PPE. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the uh, instructional models that the instruction subcommittee put together. Um, and we're gonna talk about special education. I'm gonna go through these rather quick. I know that everybody received them at home. They're also posted online. Um, so I don't wanna go take a lot of time on these. Feasibility study. Uh, the measure, we measured all of our classrooms and non-instructional spaces across the district. We had the difference between occupancy and classroom counts. And we have measurements assume everything is out of the room except for desks and tables. People, I wanna remind you, this is going to be a fairly sterile environment. We have no more furniture. We had to move that out to, to uh, maximize the amount of space we have. Um, some, I want to note that some of our non-instructional spaces, I've heard a lot about outside space cafeterias and auditoriums, etc. cetera, um, but some are just simply not practical uh, for learning purposes. And the idea and feasibility, I will tell you right now, if we were to go to a three foot distance and say that we're going to try to put everybody uh, for the entire district into school, and again, it depends on how many would actually come, at three feet, but we have estimated that by the time we retrofit our outside spaces, our auditoriums and our cafeterias, et cetera, we would need approximately 72 FTEs or full-time equivalents, uh, new teachers to be able to take the overflow of students. Uh, and I said this morning that that cost, and it's not on the slide, if you, if you take our average teacher cost, is, is it gonna be in excess of $5 million in additional expenses for teachers? And I caution us with that, even if we had the $5 million, you could hire new staff, you can get them all on board, we could spend the money if we had the five or 6 million, I figure 6 million by the time we retrofit, you could spend all that money. And if the governor um, at the last minute told us that we were gonna be remote, we would still have to pay those expenses. So what you'll find is that I don't recommend uh, the three foot and every one in. Um, so on the feasibility study here, these are the measurements. Um, you see in the chart, the high school has an enrollment, uh, approximately 1,400 students. That's obviously not staff in included. If we bring in uh, a six foot spacing, we can fit just a little over 50%, 852. Um, and if we used all of our spaces at six feet, um, and, and that's what's recommended because they're close to adult age, um, we can only fit about 1,203 into the high school. So putting them at three feet is not gonna work for us um, based on the, just the recommendations of CDC and the, um, and the amount of space we have. At the middle school, um, we have a, a Roman about a thousand. At a six foot spacing, we can do 866. We could do three foot spacing if we crammed everyone in. Um, and our three foot spaces, we could, if we use an alternate spaces uh, in there, we could fit in quite a bit more. At East school is 500. Six foot spacing is 339. Um, three foot spacing again is 629. So again, we could fit all of the students in, uh, in three foot if we take all of the furniture out. Uh, foster is 500, six foot spacing 324. At three foot spacing, it's 528. So we cannot fit everyone in. So foster is not an option. I would also say, and I didn't say this morning, foster has eight, eight classrooms down the middle that have no windows and have, uh, they don't have the same ventilation. We would not be able to use those eight classrooms and we already have a plan for repurposing uh, other locations and we're moving those teachers to other locations that do have ventilation already. Um, so we can accommodate that on the six foot. PRS 450 um, and the classrooms can hold 325 and six foot and just, uh, just about right at three foot um, can fit just about everyone at 473. South, um, we have 525 students 307 could fit in the six foot spacing and only 491 could do three. So South would not be an option 
uh, to bring students in the way it's configured, uh, even using all of our additional spaces. So our number one priority on our capacity is that safety of staff of students. Not all spaces are appropriate for teaching and learning. Classroom management considerations, teachers have limited movement around the room while maintaining appropriate, appropriate distancing. Another issue around the three foot is that if we were gonna have lunch or mass breaks, we have to put space out at a six foot minimum. So if we're in at three feet, we're gonna have a real difficult time doing that. Uh, and, and frankly, we're not sure how we could do that. Uh, New England weather poses challenges for outdoor spaces. Outdoor lunch mass breaks are not always practical. Our ability to procure modular classrooms, bubbles, tents, et cetera, takes time and funds. And there are significant supply chains uh, concerns. Right now we're running into that with um, uh, not iPads, but uh, Chromebooks uh, where we've ordered over 700 of them and we can't get them. Uh, and we're hoping to get them sooner before the start of the school year. Additional cleaning also takes time and funds. Current high, uh, HPS facilities and spaces are not designed to accommodate full, com full capacity under our required restrictions right now. They were never designed that way um, to, to have the kind of spacing they require. Budget austerity measures as well. They're long-term financial considerations. Folks, I hate to give you the bad news, but we have already been cut by the, uh, by the state when it comes to our finances. Um, the, um, the state at this point for the first quarter has uh, funded us flat with FY20, so last year, which is a loss of about $388,000. Uh, over last year, uh, or what we expected. And what I'm being told is that after we get to the first quarter, it is not looking very good for the, uh, the quarters remaining in the year. We expect that the state has lost massive amounts of revenue. There is gonna be time intensity and costly to procure in our, our uh, re retrofit our non-instructional spaces. We have time intensive and costly to hire, train, and supervise additional teachers such as the 72 that we've talked about to add additional classrooms. And in light of physical distancing and other pandemic measures uh, impacting instruction and best practices, we've asked the question, does full capacity under current restrictions best serve our academic, social, emotional needs? There are significant concerns and the staff, the principals, the staff do not believe so. And I believe them. Practical considerations of delayed and evolving guidance. So one of the things that happened, we received guidance uh, just a little, um, as recent as a week or a week and a half ago, we will continue to receive guidance uh, throughout the year. So as I've said before, expect that things will change. They're very likely to change. I wanna talk a little bit about PPE. We have already spent over $250,000 on PPE and disinfecting products. We have masks, face shields uh, for various purposes. We have regular clear uh, masks uh, for children, I mean, for, uh, for adults who are working with children and N95s. We have over 250,000 masks on hand and we are prepared to open with those. We have hand sanitizer bottles and stations. We have gloves, gowns, plexi, uh, germ barriers, cleaning electrostatic guns, disinfectant misters, um, chemicals and disinfectants and other equipment that are too lengthy to, la um, to, uh, to post here. And our protocols, we've already developed daily cleaning disinfecting protocols emergency cleaning and disinfecting protocols, laundry protocols and cleaning protocols for our buses. So in transportation, we just received this guidance. Our transportation, we have 24 full-size buses and 72 passengers. We provide regular transportation for Hingham students, including private schools. We also provide two daily buses for Boston runs for the Metco program. Special education and other transportation services are provided by Hingham as well as by outside contractors. We have 10 vans. We plan to acquire two more. We, need, we may need to uh, discuss a revision of bus policy. Given the, that we can only fit about 25 students on each bus now, we may have to, train, uh, to uh, change our policy to the state minimum of um, transporting only K to six and those who live over two miles from school. All students must wear masks on the bus. Buses are disinfected between each run and at the end of the day and developing plans to provide, we are currently developing plans to provide monitors for the first couple of weeks to ensure that mask wearing and appropriate behaviors on the bus at all times. And then we can, and we'll have to determine how long that'll have to last. Our buildings and ventilations, there were many questions. We have projects to clean all of our duct work and that's already in work and change out the filters to higher levels of, as appropriate for our equipment. 
We have projects to implement all purge systems to purge all air in the building and replace it with fresh air. Useful for late fall, winter, and winter. Dampers are 100% open until weather requires a reduction. Essentially, this brings in fresh air and ejects out of the old air. When weather requires dampers to close, some recirculated air will pass through the higher density filters and return to the buildings. Portable air conditioning units have been purchased if, uh, as needed for some rooms. Air purifiers have been purchased for isolation areas that may be without ventilation or appropriate ventilation. We are working on building management to en uh, enable the flow of students. We have labeled lanes on one-way flows, limited personal belongings that children may bring. There will be no use of lockers. There'll be no sharing of equipment or materials. Bathroom and mass breaks will be scheduled along other uh, things that we're also planning for. There are health management considerations that are working with the nurses are working on. And for the first time in my career in education, we're gonna have to begin contact tracing procedures that is only right now to the uh, Department of Public Health. So a little bit of the instructional model, you've seen this before, the learn from anywhere model. It combines in-person, hybrid and remote models. It ensures that all students have access to our rigorous curriculum, curriculum ensures that students not returning to school are fully engaged in the district's academic program. So once again, we create one uh, mode of instruction that we can deliver remotely, hybrid or in-person. It's the same regardless of where you are. So we've talked about a phased in re-entry plan overview. So in the pre-opening phase one, which begins on August 17, all of our administration office support are returning to full-time. Reopening phase two on August 26 through September 15, our faculty and support staff are gonna return for training and professional development. And then in phase one on September 16, we're gonna begin remote education or instruction for grades K through 12. We're gonna have in-person instruction for specified high need students in cohort A, B, and in person, that's the, that is a high level of an, uh, intervention services. So children in need of, of high levels of support are, are gonna be A, B. In person activities um, such as orientation, excuse me, for individual and small groups from cohorts A and B. So the process here is particularly at the elementary. So grades um, K through five, as well as six and nine, we plan to bring in smaller groups of students during that time to meet their teachers, to get the transition down uh, and to uh, develop those relationships with their staff. In phase two, which we, we plan to start on 928, this will be hybrid instructions for all in cohorts A and B. These cohorts alternate between in-person and remote instruction by half weeks. That's Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursday, Friday, with a full remote instruction on Wednesday. This is at six foot physical distance. We can bring in half of them in doing six foot distancing in two different cohorts. Remote instruction for cohort R, which we're calling fully remote when we find out who they are. And then in-person instruction for specified high need students in cohort AB. Our level three, our phase three, is that um, the two cohorts for full day um, with three foot distancing. And I wanna speak just for a moment on two we can skip into two, we may be able to move to a full day. Um, and if we're able to do that, we want to be able to do that quickly, if that's uh, available to us. And I wanna be clear that we are starting in half days um, that you'll see in a moment, but we want to increase that to full time and as much as possible, bringing students into the school. That is our goal to bring them in as much as possible to the capacity that we can, we can uh, manage. So three would be, as I said, resource dependent if we had the $6 million and were able to move uh, with that uh, process, that would be the two cohorts, both day, uh, full day, five days a week at three foot distance. And then four, phase four is uh, dependent on the governor. Uh, and that's a full return to pre-COVID, no restrictions, which I assume would be if there's a uh, viable treatment or vaccine available that allows us to move to phase four. The learn from anywhere model has been discussed before, but the factors are web-based instruction. For example, remote um, students attend live classes. And I wanna talk a lot about today, remote instruction is live streaming from the classroom uh, to the extent possible. It's gonna be a combination of both live streaming and asynchronous as it would be in the regular classroom. No teacher sits for an hour 
and lectures for an hour. It is a combination of live instruction and then independent work. It'll be the same for remote that it is uh, in person. The stream and video conferencing, this is one-to-one -one conferences, small group work over Zoom. So what could happen if we're in a classroom? We expect that if one cohort's attending and one cohort is home, they would be live streaming and remoting into that class and participating with those in person. Uh, and that will happen across all K-12. Face-to-face uh, -face classroom time, live in-person teaching is in school and distance learning. These are videos, television, audio recordings. And somebody asked a question yet, um, earlier, what does it mean television? Do we expect the children are watching television at home? No, the, the state does have um, a contract with, I think it's WCBH, um, which is some of the educational program that we still believe we have access to. Uh, and we may ask, and teachers may ask students to uh, access some programming. Remote learning. So the model of instruction is going to be synchronous learning and live instruction. I wanna be clear, synchronous learning and live instruction. We will have support of that with asynchronous learning and activities just like we do in the classroom. Our consistent platform for pre-K is Seesaw and then for Google Classroom and Microsoft Teams will be for K-12, one platform. Supplemental department, level grade or teacher materials and needs um, will, be, um, will be provided by teachers. For the students, K to one needs iPad. Um, they will have to have an iPad to, to continue through um, both home instruction and in school. Uh, grades two through 12 will have Chromebooks or laptops. And just a word on that, the district has um, a, a high number of, of Chromebooks available, as you saw last year when we gave those out in the fall and the spring. We have ordered, we have on order over 700 new uh, Chromebooks. And uh, at this point, they are delayed, uh, as they are for everyone, uh, due to the demand. Uh, I would ask that we are going to survey the parents in the next week or two. We will ask on there if you need uh, a Chromebook um, for your child. If you have the ability to, or if they already have one, please do not ask us for one. We want to make sure that every child has a Chromebook to access. So if you are in need, we will absolutely ensure to the best of our ability that you get one. And for teachers, they will have iPads, microphones, webcams um, for providing hybrid uh, instruction, laptops, and extra monitors for the hybrid. So this is a sample hybrid remote schedule. So in person on Monday and Tuesday, and they flip over on Thursday, Friday, the same. So for example, at the elementary level, we'd arrive at 8.10 in the morning. At 8.30, um, they'd have their, I'm um, sorry, at arrival at 8.10, They'd have the question of the day, so they have their morning meetings. 8.30, they'd have class meetings and attendance. 8.45, they'd have for an hour, they'd have an instructional block. At 9.45 to 10.05, they'd have a movement uh, or mass break. 10.05 to 11.05, once again, an hour long instructional block. 11.05 to 11.25 is a movement and mass break. 11.25 to 12.15 is another instructional block. And then 12.15 to 12.30 will be dismissal so that we can sanitize preview remote assignments and expectations. 12.31, they travel time home. At one o'clock, they'd have lunch at home. At 1.30, we'd have them back remotely with all of us, uh, do an asynchronous specialist. This could be music, art, phys ed, um, things like that in the afternoon. And then two o'clock, teacher assigned uh, remote activities. Uh, so it is a full day of in-person or remote. On the remote side for our sample schedule, 8.30, they'd have a class meeting, so that would be live with their other cohort. 8.45 to 10, uh, 9.45, the instructional block, which will be both in synchronous and asynchronous instruction as it is in the classroom, live streamed. 9.45 is break. 10 o'clock is synchronous specialist class. So again, that could be reading instruction, could be, could be music, it could be all, uh, on a host of things. 10.30, another instructional block with synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, 11.30, a break and a movement. 11.45 lunch, then we'd expect at 12.30 to 1.30, our students would be back in instructional blocks um, for, uh, for additional synchronous live streaming or, or live instruction, as well as asynchronous support. 1.30, they'd have a break, and then 1.45 to 2.30, back into instruction uh, block again with uh, live instruction from a teacher. So a very robust program and very different than it was in the, in the spring. I do wanna caution people, I know that people want children back to school and it looks like why only a half a day? Well, first of all, our children have had 
six months of time out of the classroom. They need to be reacclimated to the setting. Second of all, this is not the classrooms they came out of. Children are used to being up and down, moving around the classroom, interacting with one another, close with one another, playing with one another, et cetera. That is not going to be the environment we can allow. At best, even in the classroom with masks, they can be three feet apart from one another. This is going to be a huge adjustment. We need to have the adjustment time in the first couple of weeks to, to be able to help them understand the classroom, the routines, and adjust to that routine. It's also been asked on multiple times, why the first eight days, why not start instruction immediately? The reason for that is, as I said, we're gonna bring in small groups of children so that they can, uh, um, so they can learn the, the environment, so they can meet their teachers, so they can begin that relationship, understand the safety rules. So when they do come to school, those are all down and we can get right down to business. It's going to take some time to get them adjusted. We believe that starting slow and moving out uh, slow, slowly as well, or advancing slowly, will help us get to a place of full instruction faster. We would rather, in, in short, um, we would rather start small and go big versus big, fail and have to go small. So for the high school, uh, middle school, it would be on a, um, a six block schedule, um, which is a little different than the high school you see on Monday, Tuesday, period one, uh, 7.30 to eight, then we go 8.10 to 8.40. We have to plan right now 10 minutes for movement because we're not sure how that movement's gonna happen until we get live students in. So they may get, if it only takes five minutes, we'll increase the class time. If it takes 12, we might have to make some, we're hoping it doesn't, uh, we can say that. Um, second period is 8.10 to 8.40. Third is 8.50 to 9.20, 9.40 to 10.10. Um, then 10.20 to 10.50. The sixth period is 11 to 11.30. We would dismiss at 11.30 and in the afternoon, we would have our specials such as music, PE, uh, and other remote activities. Um, so that is our plan for the, um, and it would be live streaming again. These children at home will be live streaming into the classroom. So if you're a cohort A, you're attending in person. If you're B, you're attending from home and, and streaming into the class. For the secondary level uh, at the high school, we've broken into seven uh, blocks. Seven is what the normal student takes to uh, during a day. Um, so you can see that we have class one, two, three on, on Mondays uh, and four, five, six on Tuesdays. Those are 75 minute classes to get all six in. Um, we believe that that'll take us to about 12.05, so about four, four hours or so, and that um, we'll dismiss the students. And in the afternoon, they would be in their non-mass specials. So these are, these are the elective classes they would take. Again, it could be music, art, PE, all of those things that um, children want to take or students want to take. Um, that we can do unmasked um, from remote. Uh, in addition to those electives, there will be uh, online help available to students in the afternoon uh, for the last half hour, um, for office hours for teachers to ask for extra help, et cetera. So that will happen for both. And again, like the other levels, as the first cohort is in on Monday and Tuesday, cohort B will be live streaming into those classes with them. On Wednesday at this, at this time, we have everyone remote. Um, and that is, uh, they're a little different schedule where we have half hour, but both cohorts are together on Wednesdays. Uh, it'll be half hour blocks uh, and they would finish the day at 12 o'clock. Um, and so that's the, the schedule there. The Wednesday, again, the reason for the Wednesday is to really do a deep cleaning. Um, and if we find that that deep cleaning doesn't, um, I've heard a lot of ideas and I've listened to those um, people who are asking if there's a way we can have Wednesday as a class time. We are gonna look at that as well. Um, and see if we can actually revert that to class time, if that's a possibility. Um, but right now, if we get to the, um, the stage of voting on Monday, uh, Thursday night, that is the plan as it sits, but we would have to adjust. Uh, and we're certainly willing to do that. We'll work through those numbers. So the hybrid cohort construction is, it's, um, when we talk about transportation, we're looking at geographic area um, as our main concern. So it looks like we'll, we'll try to create cohorts A and B from geographic areas. So children in the same neighborhoods, et cetera, we would attend. The group names will be group A and B, which is a half for the general population together. Group AB, um, the students will attend in-person learning uh, with independent of group A or A, B. Or B. Um, these students will be full day um, and five days a week. Group R, these are students who will attend via remote learning only uh, and their schedules will be independent. 
And then the, uh, there are some complexities that we're trying to work through, particularly with the high school with uh, over 1,300 uh, students uh, and, and some 1,300 different uh, and very unique schedules. So it may be a little more difficult to figure out how to group them in A, B. So they'll be working on that. So this is, again, real quick, um, just looking at the timing. Phase one begins August 17th through 21st. The expectation of staff, we're six feet apart. Our masks are warm while, uh, worn at all times while in district facilities. Uh, we're gonna have the contact tracing uh, practices in place, and then we'll have consistent and routine hand washing and cleansing and things like that, the sanitizing uh, protocols. At two, we begin the 26th, uh, bringing our new teachers, our, all of our teachers in for orientation. We'll have a substantial, and, and you'll see in the plan uh, that you get hopefully tonight, uh, a very uh, robust uh, professional development plan um, that we have for you. Um, so this will be the time for convocation, our faculty meetings, the district professional development program and planning and prep that begins on the 26th and goes to the, 6th, the 15th. We will have six foot distancing. The mask will be worn uh, in district facilities, we'll have contact tracing, et cetera. Phase one of students is the 16th. Uh, it is remote opening for grades K through 12, in-person opening for cohort AB, and we will be having individual and small groups of students starting on the 16th. Um, this will be a learn from anywhere model. Um, we will be looking at six foot of distance. And again, we'll expect all students, all students, that's K or pre-K through 12 to wear their mask while in district facilities. And we will have contact tracing that we will put in place. Phase two, which we will be evaluated on September 28th. And I'm gonna say health metrics. I'm still working with the Department of Public Health. And as of this morning, they were telling us we were gonna get more guidance from Massachusetts Department of Public Health of what the benchmarking will be. Um, so I don't have that for you right now, but we are working on that. For example, whether that's gonna be 5% or less positive rate. And right now we're a little over 2% in Massachusetts. So we would be still the green light to go. That's just an example. Um, our start is 50% capacity. Um, the students remain in cohorts. We do have a reduced day for, for most, eight to 12. Um, we're gonna learn from anywhere um, and we'll have six feet um, apart with masks worn by all. Phase three is that full um, capacity, uh, full day, um, which would be uh, dependent upon resources. Uh, and that means the physical distance is at three feet along with creating a lot of additional classroom space and adding staff. Our resources, we've already talked about, just to get you an idea for elementary staffing, we'd need 24 new uh, classroom teachers, 20 special education teachers, five additional speech therapists, and one occupational therapist. At the middle school, to go full, we'd need 5.6 full-time equivalents, and at the high school, we'd need 10. Um, the physical spaces we'd use is cafeteria overflow, we need spaces for music, chorus, PE, et cetera, and classroom and therapy um, spaces, we need approximately 66 of them, even at three foot spacing. The logistics is the new middle school and high school schedules are, are really complex and they're working through those. Phase four starts when the governor tells us that Massachusetts is no longer in, uh, or we can go back to pre-COVID conditions. No, I can't see the video. So I wanna talk a little bit about special ed for a moment. Preschool students will be instructed in person at the East Integrated Preschool. Community peers will be included when there is confidence uh, that we can do the, that safely. Sub students in substantially separate programs, the RISE, CLC, et cetera, will attend school in person for full days, five days a week. Most other students requiring special education supports and services will participate in general instruction in the morning, stay for lunch, and receive specialized instruction in the afternoon. Schedule will be, schedules will be individualized and shared with families. So if you have a student with an IEP, they will, re they will receive the instruction everybody else does. When the other students are received, uh, leave at 12, uh, we would feed these children, then they will receive their, their services in the afternoon as space becomes available. This is the level of student need and I'll let you read that on your own. Uh, you have the slides, um, but it talks about the metrics and how we determine level of student need. Special considerations are that um, teams will continue to make individual determinations for the delivery of instruction, especially in, in these unique circumstances. Our students with emotional disabilities who are unable to access remote instruction, independent independent of specialized instruction 
Students with high risk medical conditions who require an individual uh, plan for services. Students who are homeless or foster care. Students who use augmentative communication and students who are eligible for both EL, um, English language and uh, special education services. And the other thing I didn't mention, uh, one question that came up and, and I, sorry, I left it to the minute uh, last time, but, uh, or left to the last minute. Uh, many people have asked the question about attendance and grading. Attendance will be mandatory. Absolutely mandatory. We expect just like a regular school day that you will be attending uh, in person or remote the same time. And the other part is grading. We will no longer be grading pass fail. This will be traditional grading where you receive the feedback from teachers uh, as you would uh, during a regular pre-COVID uh, classes. So that's it. Thank you. I know that was just about 39 minutes. Okay, Dr. Austin, thank you so much. Um, we're going to open it up to uh, questions now, and um, I we only we don't have too much time for questions, so um, I will at some point say that where the last person will be, and um, I'd like to open it up right now to Valerie Robin, and if I could, I'd like to remind you to please state your name and address, please. Okay. Valerie Robin, what's your question? Um, thank you, Valerie Robin at 136 uh, Downer Ave. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, each of you who has participated in this undertaking. This includes the elected officials, the volunteers, the staff, the faculty, and the school administration. Uh, thank you um, for your efforts. Thank you for the plan. Um, and I think I, I want to acknowledge that. Um, my question has to do, um, I'm, I understand the concept between cohort A and cohort B. I understand the idea of what Wednesday with the deep cleaning is all about. What I can't get my hands around is the one common factor in, co in cohort A and B is the teachers and the administrations. So what's supposedly happening that we have to separate cohort A and B, yet the same teacher is gonna be with a and B, what, what I'm missing something. How, how, how is that protecting anybody? Cause they're, I mean, I just, I'm, I'm missing something. I, this is the second time I've come. So I've like analyzed, I've watched this. Um, I didn't quite get my hands around why we need a deep cleaning. I'm not certain what that really does. What I don't understand is the teacher still it's not like we're separating the teacher and the teacher, there's a cohort A teacher and a cohort B teacher. That might make sense. Well, Valerie, you have the same teacher, but you have a different set of students. So if we have uh, 12 students in a classroom in cohort A, um, those same desks are gonna use, be, be used by cohort B uh, in the same classroom. So the deep cleaning is about cleaning those, those spaces. Uh, and, and cleaning all those desks and those surfaces uh, from cohort A so that you've separated the students. At least we've done our best to try to, again, um, it's student to student that we're trying to, to protect. And, and you know, and, and I wanna say, as I said earlier, we're gonna look at that and maybe we don't need that day. Maybe we can add that for a day. I've seen some creative thinking in other places where they've all, and I, and I spoke actually after the last uh, meeting this morning with the elementary principals of potentially looking at Maybe we bring, a, um, we bring a rotating A and B in on the Wednesday um, so that students have an additional day. Um, and so that could be a model that uh, we would think about uh, between now and the start of school. Um, so, so that's kind of our thinking right now. Thank you. I, I think I, I misspoke or I didn't make it quite clear. I, I conceptually get that you're gonna clean down the desks, but again, the teachers being exposed to cohort A and cohort B. So when cohort A goes to school the next time, those students are now exposed to a teacher who was exposed to cohort B. That's the issue I'm, I'm trying to get my hands around. Yeah, and, and, and the only way to do that and not have that happen is to double them, um, double the number of teachers um, so that we don't have that. And, and there's just, I mean, that's not gonna be practical. There's, there's no way to do that. But, but then don't we have to come up, and I'm gonna let someone else speak, but don't we have to then come up with a way that we're gonna minimize that exposure problem as it relates to the teachers of in cohort A and B. If we don't absolutely, have, that's absolutely. All. Yeah. I, I thought it was because you can't, you just can't fit that many kids all in the same time. It doesn't have to do with. 
I mean, that's that's the bigger issue, and I think you're absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. Um, Stephanie Gert, what's your question, please? Hi, thank you, Libby. Um, so I have two questions, uh, but I'll ask them quickly. So for the sixth graders, when will they receive their Chromebooks? Um, I, I don't know that answer yet. Um, it'll be before the start of school, I hope. <laughs> okay. But I, I just understand in the past, it's not typically before the start of school. So I just wanted to make sure that it was, because I haven't set her up with a new computer thinking that she was going to get a Chromebook. Yeah. And then just I, I think, the, Stephanie, I think we're okay. going to have to have a protocol for that because it's obviously a different start. And so we need to have them right. on. They need to have them ahead of time. So we're going to have to have a protocol of when we're going to do it, kind of like what we did this uh, this last year. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then um, just for the students on IEP, um, we'll be finding out soon what category we fit into um, in terms of whether we're coming back for schooling, extra schooling, things like that. Uh, Suzanne Venice, do you want to answer that? I know you're on the line. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, thank you for the question. <clears throat> um, our goal right now is to offer in-person services to um, as many students as possible, hopefully all of them. Um, so the guidelines from um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, has, you know, a um, set of guidelines that prioritizes who receives in-person services, but our um, as a district, we are focused on um, providing them to everyone. Uh, and if we can't do that, uh, then it goes based on level of need, which is part of the IEP. So it's not a, um, um, a, a decision that just gets made emotionally or, or um, based on um, parent feedback or um, anything like that. It, it's based on the amount of services that are in the IEP. Uh, but you would be provided with a schedule by the, by the teachers before the first day of students um, schooling. Great. Okay. Ideally, I mean, if we can know a little sooner than that, I'm just sort of wrestling with all of the child care issues. So if yeah, my child's going to be in school versus not in school. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm going to um, say that we've got, I think, nine more people with their hands raised. And I'm going to ask that nobody else raise their hand at this point. We are going to try to get to all of these people who do already have their hand raised. It will take us over the um, hour limit. Um, so I, I apologize, but we do have another forum and we do have plenty of other op opportunities for you to reach out to us. So the next person, please, is Holly Sullivan. Hi, Holly Sullivan, 8 Edgar Walker Court. Um, my question, Dr. Austin, you touched on um, just a minute ago is about student accountability and grading. Um, is the curriculum this is going to be similar as years past that the teachers are teaching toward, to some degree, the MCAS yeah. testing? Um, and also in the spring, there was a lot of optional um, assignments and a lot of optional work, which I know, especially at the older levels, means they don't really have to do it if they don't want to do it. Um, how is that going to be different this fall than it was in the spring? Great question, Holly. Uh, two different things with that. Uh, I, um, first of all, the, um, the curriculum we're going to use is just like it, it, it's the same that we're going to use in the regular school program. Um, so we plan to move ahead with a year's worth of progress in curriculum as we would if we were alive in school full time. Um, so it's going to be intensive instruction, but that's our intent. To the spring, we were given guidance by Desi to say, do not, um, you know, do not expect attendance, make things optional, uh, et cetera. That was the guidance. We now have guidance that says that's not the way we're going to do it. Uh, so we will have accountability. People will have to attend and there will be uh, accountability for grading, et cetera. So it will be a rigorous curriculum delivered by teachers, whether it's in person or remote. Uh, and the expectation is that the, um, the, the students uh, make the gains as they would, regardless of what they, where, where they're at. Um, sorry, it's been a long day already, so and I've got one more of these. Uh, it's it's going to be regardless of if you're in school or at home. Okay, thank Okay, you. great. Thank you. All right, uh, Suzanne Garland. Suzanne went for lobster. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, there you are, barely. Oh. 
Okay. So, so um, the current plan um, calls for, oh, sorry, 18 Maryville Drive, Hingham, Massachusetts. Um, the current plan calls for a large remote component. Um, last spring, we heard the Massachusetts Teachers Association um, themselves stated that remote learning does not work. Uh, from their website, and I'm looking at it right now, it says, this is a complicated issue that raises ongoing equity concerns about how teaching new content will impact students who are not able to engage effectively or at all with online learning. We are hearing from more and more members, meeting teachers, that remote instruction is extremely challenging for students, families, and educators alike. So my question is, why are we moving forward now when our numbers are extremely low with remote learning, given the equity issues and how challenging it is for all involved? So Suzanne, I'm gonna ask you this question. Have you been watching the metrics lately? I have, yes, very yeah, close. I mean, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we were getting 100 cases a day. And now yep. we're up to yesterday was 430. Now I'm hoping that we can be in person. There's no question in my mind, none at all, that the absolutely ideal is to have students to the absolute extent possible in our classrooms. That's where we want them. Remote is not the ideal, right? We know that. And so we were live synchronous last year. We were not doing that. And so we have to make that the best, most robust we can do right now. We do anticipate, and you're seeing it already, that many school districts have already gone and said, we're gonna go full remote. We need to prepare for that so that if that happens, I can flip that switch in a minute and we can go directly to remote and not lose an ounce of instructional time. It's not ideal, but we have to prepare because that's the reality that we're facing. We now have people in, we now have people in Massachusetts and this morning, we're asking the governor to consider moving back to phase two. We're going in the reverse direction that we want to be. And I hope that's just a, it's just a blip on the screen. And if things change, we bring more children in and we try to do that. We have to be able to adjust as we go on. Right, but I guess my question still remains about the equity issue. And especially for our younger K through two students who don't even know many of them how to read or write yet, how will those students navigate a website and learn online? I mean, I you can't expect a kindergartner to navigate to a specific yeah, please, please give uh, Dr. Austin a chance to answer your question. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely correct. And I, um, you know, I, I have two, I have three first grade grandchildren entering who lost most of their kindergarten year last year. I understand the same questions that I have of what they're going to get. It's going to have to come through real creativity in our teachers um, to be able to deliver that. Uh, and there's no easy answer for that. Um, because I watched what it did to my grandchildren. Um, and so I get it. I understand. It's the same concerns I have. So we're going to ask our teachers to be creative and do the very best they can for all students, regardless. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Kaja Fix, please. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. That's okay. It's not English-based. Uh, my name is <laughs> Kaya Fickus, and I'm at Two Bishops Lane, and I have elementary and middle school children. And actually, this dovetails nicely because I do just want to make the comment that perhaps more than ever before, the partnership between teachers and parents is going to be paramount here. And so um, my hope is that in reorienting the teachers and their communication line with parents that we're going to be receiving real clarity on what the curriculum goals are, what units our students, our, our kids are undertaking um, because I'm not trained as a para and I'm gonna be a para and you know didn't do a great job of it in the spring. So as much of those resources as can be given and communications can be given to us that that will be incredibly helpful in moving the needle for our kids. Great, Kaya. Uh, I love the spelling of the name. Um, thank you for the comment. I think that's great information for us and great feedback uh, for our principals. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kristen Moore, what is your question, please, Kristen? Hi, Kristen Moore, 120 South Pleasant Street. Um, I am in total piggybacking on Kaya's comment with regards to that, because the experience in the spring uh, was vastly different from teacher to teacher, de 
depending on what your child had, that if there were guidelines given that all teachers had to follow, it would make life infinitely easier, infinitely easier. Um, but that was not my question. <laughs> um, I had uh, a question with regards to uh, cohort AB, the uh, kids that are going to be going in every day. Does that mean that these children are going to be mixed with both group A and group B within the classrooms? Uh, I'll, I'll ask Dr. Venice to answer that. I, I'm fairly certain of that answer, but I'll ask Dr. Venice. That's a great question. So um, the students who have to come, who are coming every day for full days are in self-contained programs. So they will be in their own cohort with their, with their um, teacher. There will be, I would imagine, some students who will need to come um, in both cohorts, but that number will be very, very low. Oh, okay. My second question, if you will, was you'd made a comment that full day was not a great option at this point in time in within the hybrid because students need to get used to interacting. They can't get up and down. Well, I'd say that is a very accurate description for elementary kids. I would say that is not the case for high school kids. High school kids are leveled courses. Many of them are in honors courses. They just want to get down and back to business. Mm -hmm. That going on a half day for high school kids, I don't think is fair and in their best interest for education. So well, what would be the reason not to send high school kids back to school full day as opposed to the underage children? I, I want to, I'm going to let somebody from the high school answer that, uh, who does it well. But when we say half day, four hours, that's not a half day. Four hours and 15 minutes, four hours and a half is not a half day. We would generally do a six hour day, so we're talking two thirds day. Um, so we're clear. I, I know that's semantics, but I understand. Now I'm going to ask somebody from the high school because that complexity of that um, schedule, I know, is part of the reason. Okay. So does anybody in the high school, Rick, or any of the assistant principals, Nicole, or anybody on? Mary Andrews, I know you're there. Katie uh, Roberts would be another one. Rick, Katie, are you on? Uh, sure. I'm happy to take that one, uh, uh, Kristen. So Thanks, uh, as you as you can imagine, uh, we very much recognize the different needs of different levels. So clearly the needs um, and learning styles of a student in K2 is different than the high school. So at the high school, we were prioritizing a few things. One is obviously college readiness. You know, when we're talking about um, high school students, we're talking about college readiness. We also really try to maintain the choice and the rich a range of elective offerings that we have at the high school. So we want all of our students heading off for pre-med to still be able to take AP Bio and AP Chemistry. We still want our students who are heading off to Emerson to major in music to still have access to those electives. And so this schedule um, does preserve um, the, the complex schedule that we have here. And so again, um, uh, moving to a full day would actually limit those choices and limit the range of electives that we can offer. And so um, perhaps we made an assumption um, about um, kind of priorities at the high school, but just wanted to kind of let you know some of the, the kind of the working assumptions that we had. We also do know too um, that um, spacing um, the students at, at, at the recommended uh, six feet for the purposes of lunch adds additional challenges to the day, we would have to have almost 12 seatings of lunch at the high school. And so you can imagine the amount of instructional time that would be lost to that. And again, we also wanted to preserve, um, again, those unmasked electives. For some students, music is the highlight of their day. Uh, music, so chorus, um, uh, woodwinds, um, um, and um, some of the other electives, uh, drama, for example, that need to be done unmasked. In order to preserve those electives, we are including an additional hour of elective remote instruction at the end of the day. So the full amount of time on learning in the day is closer to five, five hours and, and a bit um, because there will be that additional um, elective 
um, added at the end of the day. Um, also, we, we did have a really terrific um, uh, community member, Ed Bagley, um, who is a professor at Northeastern, uh, who was on our um, uh, education subcommittee, and he um, has a lot of experience um, teaching in the remote environment. So he did recommend the block schedule, um, which is what we ultimately landed on, and also helped inform our pedagogy in terms of, of how to maximize and um, make best use of those um, instructional blocks in the block schedule. Um, and so hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of where we were headed. I might add to that too, if that's okay, uh, to piggyback on what Katie said about Ed's input, that, that um, we did move to those longer blocks, sort of imitative of the college experience, because we did think that that matched what high schoolers could do, as well as cutting down on passing time. Um, the other thing that we were really mindful of is the fact that if we just went back to school with the two cohorts and had the, you know, it, um, the full day and had to deal with all the problems that lunch poses, we also have um, the fact that the kids live streaming from home, what that would look like is looking at your computer from 8 to 2.30 with three minutes between each of the seven blocks. And we were really trying to make a schedule that took all of the things into account when we were figuring out what would be best for students. Thank you so much. I appreciate your thoughtfulness as to this. Um, and some of these facts, if they were made more readily available, I think that people's stresses would go down if they could find out some of the basis for this information and it would just alleviate some of the tension and stress that's around. And that, that should be coming this evening. I did want to make one other point too, and that is- yeah, You um, ran out of your two minutes, Katie, but I go know, ahead. I'm sorry. We did, we did strip studies out of the schedule. So that is, that, that is part of um, the reason for the reduction in time. There's no, new, no reason to have a student sitting in a study hall exposed to you know, uh, uh, you know, potential germs and so on. And so that's one of the pieces that reduces the school day. So I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Can I can I just make before you go on to the next? I know we're going to go over Libby, and that's uh, that's hard, but but you know, people, I the 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 way that this worked, and I said this before, our initial thoughts, our thoughts, our small thoughts were due to the Commissioner of Education on August. I mean, on July thirty first, last Friday, and we have been working on these things since May, and so we gave that, and what we tried to give you on Friday night was just a small snapshot of our thinking thinking that we were giving you a little bit of information and trying to add to just, here's what our thinking was. We were only given until August 10th to complete our last report um, and our final report, um, which is not much of a time, uh, you know, turnover, that's for sure, from being able to get feedback from the school committee uh, and educators. Now, the reality is that tonight, we do plan to launch our draft, and I'll please say draft. You may find typos, you may find some misuse of language, hopefully not, um, but you may find those because the draft is over 70 pages of a lot of materials uh, and heavy reading. So I hope to get that to you tonight, but please understand it's still a draft uh, and that we were working on that. We will work on that all the way through um, the 10th. So thank you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, so our next question comes from Noelle Jarrod. You can correct my pronunciation if you need to. Oh, that was very good. Um, yes, Noelle Jarrod, uh, 9 Highfield Road, and um, I have a middle schooler. Um, so my question actually has to do with all the questions that I know people have emailed in. Um, there's no possible way that you can answer all of them in a, in a forum like this. Will there be um, an attempt made to try to pose all the questions and answer them and then email the responses? How is that being handled? Well, I, I, first of all, I received over, I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 of those. And I spent the entire weekend reading through those. Um, and so, um, you know, the reality is I have a team of three people in this office with me. Um, we're doing our very best to provide those answers. We hope that a lot of the answers are in the big document that you get tonight. Um, and our continued conversation. Okay. What I would, what I'd like to propose is that, you know, we're going to have our, another uh, forum night, which is, <laughs> I wouldn't suggest you return because we're going to say the same things probably, but you're welcome to come back. Um, we will talk about it. I'm sure at the school committee again tomorrow night where they'll start to weigh in. Um, I'm sure there'll be more conversation on the 10th. And I want to tell you that once they approve a plan, that's not going to be the final plan. 
right? We're still taking feedback. We're still working through the plan. It may change. The hours might change. All kinds of things. So I ask us to be flexible. We are listening to your questions and concerns. Absolutely, we're listening to them, and we're trying to answer those to the best of our ability. I would also suggest at one point that we break down into, and I'm going to ask this to the principals, perhaps having Zoom with their families um, per building. So you can answer a lot of those questions. Um, so you can answer things that are specific to elementary or middle or high school that are much better than me trying to give it to you right here because they're experts in their building. Um, so hopefully that will work. That's a great idea. Thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, next question comes from Brooke Carey. It's Libby. Um, three Country Drive. Hang on. Um, I'm just trying to understand how the cohorts interplay with the phases. I don't understand if all students will have an in-person experience in one of starting in phase two, or if the phases impact the cohorts, meaning some kids get to go after the highest need of phase one, some more kids get to go, but not all, and then a couple more get to go in phase three. I just, I don't, it's not clear to me from, and I've read everything. So could somebody okay. explain the overlap of the cohorts and the phases, please? Thanks, Brooke. Great question. Uh, in phase two that starts on January, uh, the 28th, hopefully of September, all students will begin in person. So A, B, will A will go Monday, Tuesday right now. B will go Thursday, Friday. Great. All students. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so Victoria Warnack is next, please. Hi there, Victoria Warnack, 14 Cottage Street. Um, thank you all so much for all of your hard work. Uh, my children will be entering grades 7, 10, and 12. And so we have three kids streaming simultaneously, um, most of whom are on really ambitious programs. And I, we're gearing up hard for the technology challenge and for making sure everybody has a space in the house to make that work. My question was, are you able to record those live streams, the, the classroom sessions themselves, so that in the event that there's a technology crash here, um, especially in the upper grades. I don't know if you can legally do that, but like it would be hard to miss out on 15 minutes of AP Physics or AP Chem. Um, and I don't know if there's any way to kind of rescue that if we have a bandwidth issue or a technology issue in the house. But I, I just thought I'd throw it out there, especially for certain classes, it could be really valuable. Thank you, Victoria. That's a great question and, and great point. First of all, I would tell you that with, with one student in 10 and 12, particularly at the high school, they may not be on the same schedule. They may be in different cohorts um, just because of the complexity of schedule. Um, so don't count on that, that because that's gonna be much trickier to get there. The that's issue of record, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might request that and say, get them out of the house at the same time. Look, go, quick, go. Um, I, I would say that um, the, the issue of recording is really tricky. We have broached that a little bit. I know that teachers are, are are, are not horribly, um, I, I think they're concerned about some of the, the, the features of that. And um, I, I understand that. I think there's a lot of legality issues around that. We are thinking about that. Um, I wouldn't count on recording, um, but but let's, we're gonna continue talking about it, okay? That's, that's fine. In the absence of that, it would be really helpful if everyone has very robust handouts and slides and, and ways to both, um, capture the material and mark attendance in the case of technology issues in the home. Fair enough. Great, great, great feedback, Victoria. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got, um, and, and people, please, I please ask you not to raise your hands anymore. We're already over time. Um, I'm going to let um, a few more slide in. Uh, Jess had her hand up. Um, please, Jess, what was your question? Hi, Jessica Bonagorio, 10 Cliff Road in Hingham. So my question is just that um, it had been mentioned before that it's sometime in October that there was a possibility that students in cohorts A and B would move from that half day or three quarter day to a full day, um, just the two days a week. And I just wanted to know if that was still on the table depending on the metrics and how things go, or is that completely off the table? Thank you. I, I'm going to be really clear that everything's on the table. 
Um, there's no such thing as off. Um, my objective, and it has been from the very beginning, you've heard this me all along, I want to get as many students in as long as possible that I can do that safely. So if I can do that, we're going to find a way to do that. We are not, right after this morning's meeting, I went in with some of the elementary principals and we started kicking around some ideas to increase, you know, is there a way to do Wednesdays? Those, those are conversations we're having. Nothing is off the table. Okay, thank you. And we you. will continue that process and we're going to work hard uh, all the way through this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're getting down to the wire here. Liza McKinnon, please. Hi, um, 178 North Street. Actually, several of my questions have already been answered, but um, I just want to be clear. I have a rising ninth grader, and I have a middle schooler, but I have a rising ninth grader. I, they will be uh, escorted in or have the opportunity to be in the building to understand kind of the drill uh, prior to the rest of the high school. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what I've asked. The, I don't know exactly what that looks like yet, Liza. I don't think, Rick, are you on the line, Rick? Yes, I'm here, so. Paul. Oh, yeah. I don't, thank you, Rick. Um, do you have anything yeah. for that yet? I know we talked about that and, and the possibly getting the ninth graders in. Yes, we, we don't have the plans finalized or the date set yet, but it, absolutely a commitment that we will offer a freshman orientation for all our incoming ninth graders. Uh, I think we're all agreed that that's a very high priority and that we will find a way to get all those rising ninth graders into the building to um, learn their way around, meet their teachers, um, and prepare for a successful transition into the high school. And then and I, I also, if I can, I'm sorry, Liza, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I had a totally practical question. I have an eighth grader going to ninth grade, the same kid, obviously. Um, we were told to not return our Chromebooks. Yeah. What are, I, we, what, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> I see Mary Andrews is, uh, and I, I think she's she might have some in on the technology side. Mary, I do. <laughs> I, 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 so just a practical question yeah. there. I was like, I don't yeah. know what we're supposed to do. <laughs> that is the plan. The eighth, the eighth going into ninth, will hold on to them. Those will be their Chromebooks for this school year too. Um, oh, so, okay. Yep. They're they're all, all right. So sixth graders will receive them hopefully in the next few weeks. So oh, those okay, great. So six, so seven, eight, eight, nine should be all set. Perfect. I was going to buy our laptop, but now we don't no, need to. No, eighth grade is holding on to them in coming Great. ninth grade. That's why they weren't collected. So, okay. Thanks for that. Can I just add, um, we just talked about ninth grade, but we also want to talk about um, the same kind of thing with, with six and K, um, looking at orientations for them. And so expect for those, if you have a kindergarten student or a sixth grade student, there'll be some thinking about that as well, about how we can give them some additional time and, and energy uh, will be spent on them, uh, bringing them into the buildings, et cetera, and getting them used to where they are. Uh, I can't imagine as a as an incoming kindergarten, uh, this might be a little daunting right now. Um, we get it. So thanks. Go ahead, Libby. Libby, sorry. That's okay. Do, do we have time for one more, Dr. Austin? What you have you whatever you want. I am yours. All right, let's do it. One more from Sky Carlson, please. Sky? Are you muted, maybe? We can't hear you. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> there you are. Nice guy. The question is um, around the remote learning um, curriculum and the, the schedule that has been set up in terms of the synchronous learning. Um, a lot of us who are, have working families are trying to figure out ways that we can sort of come together and pull resources so that we can you know, have somebody watching kids, helping them get on to things and, and what have you. And I find the, that having um, the, it, the, the schedule that's the entire day, like their entire day being scheduled out with, you know, 15 minutes of a break and then a, an hour of a block where you're on the computer and then another 15 minute break and then an hour of the block on the computer. I find that really difficult um, in how, you know, in, in in trying to to pull together with other families and and create I'll call it a pod right create a pod where we can like have instruction happening maybe you know um with like a nanny or a tutor or a teacher remotely so is it a requirement that if that schedule is presented that's the schedule that we would have to do or is there another remote learning option where um you know, dialing into the, the remote learning sessions, but then also being able to just 
I mean, I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out what to balance here and, and I, it's just really confusing and hard. And I'm wondering if there has been any thought given to that. Sky, thank you for your question. And, and when you say, is there any thought to that? I mean, I think that's the stuff we've been pouring over forever. The, yeah. the schedule we gave you is kind of our sample right now where we are. We're gonna to continue to refine that as we move forward. One of the options would be, uh, we had an option of saying, okay, if we have remote families, we, we don't know. And so we're gonna do a, a survey in another week or so uh, and asking which ones of you are planning to come in and which one are you gonna be remote? We do know we have a lot of families out there that are gonna stay remote. Um, so one of the options, the state did give us the ability to buy into a, what I'm gonna call a canned program um, that they've put together and purchased that, which would be a, a different remote where you would be able to kind of access a uh, instruction from a different location um, or, or a different curriculum. Uh, that'll still be robust. It'll still be everything that we're probably doing, but just in a different manner. Um, that might be an option. We'll consider that as we go on. I know that's really hard to kind of figure out because I think we've created such a robust now uh, schedule for remote. That's going to be hard too. Um, so we really need to be thinking about that. And, and thanks for bringing that to us because I hadn't heard that yet. So I think that's something for, for us to think about and how we might uh, make that a little easier for families that may not have the same schedule, et cetera. Thank you. I know that wasn't the answer, but it's something we're gonna have to <laughs> think on. No, I mean, have it, even even keeping it in the um, in the the idea would be good. And I do echo the one person that somebody said here was that having consistency from a technology perspective from teacher to teacher is really huge. And yeah. so if we can make sure that like, you know, even if, um, you know, like I had made the suggestion to our PTO that maybe we have like technology committees, you know, at per grade level, we got enough parents in this town that know technology pretty well and could help like create consistent like delivery of information and timelines like I had my teacher didn't utilize Google Classroom's calendar for example so I could never figure out when things were you know stuff yeah. like that like they're just they're just ways to utilize the technology and to do it consistently and I'm sure that's being looked at but um, it, it, it was a huge issue in the um, <coughs> in the inconsistency even Sorry. within the grade from one teacher to the Sorry. next. Thank you so much we understand and there will definitely be more consistency going forward from last spring. So um, on that note, I will uh, like to thank again everybody for coming. I know we will see a lot of you again at 7 o'clock. And uh, I will call the subcommittee, the community outreach subcommittee. Um, I will ask for a motion to adjourn it. And then uh, Terry Lee can adjourn the full school committee. So I have a motion to adjourn this subcommittee, please. I'll make a motion to adjourn the subcommittee of the community outreach. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Carrie? Okay, I'll take a motion to adjourn the subcommittee at 548. So moved. Okay, a second. 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 Okay, thank you, Michelle and Liza. Uh, Michelle? Aye. Jen? Aye. Uh, Aye. Carlos? Aye. Libby? Aye. And I'm an eye as well. Okay, thank you, everyone.